You know, I am, as some of you know, a, a recovering politician. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was in elected office for 12 years. I ran for mayor in D.C. in 1998. And uh, understanding, free, freeman, uh, understanding freedom, like Dr. Friedman, uh, I was really free when I left office. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's easy for me to, 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 to throw stones and say, you know, if you're running for office, you should speak freely. But I would tell you something. You know, uh, Americans have always responded more to straight talk as opposed to the gobbledygook that we hear from a lot of our folks who are a lot of my, my fellow elected brethren. And to speak honestly and directly about what's going on in today's schools is not to preach or proselytize doom and gloom. It is to be candid about the fact that America is failing its school children. We are failing our school children. McKinsey and Company just this spring, this past April, released a first of its kind landmark report on the economic consequences and impact of the achievement gap in America. They looked at how the difference between how the haves and have-nots perform on standardized testing, how it's affected the country from an economic point of view. And as they did their studies, they not only compared what was going on state by state around the, the country, they also looked at how we rank from an economic point of view in terms of our educational shortfalls vis-a-vis -vis the international global community. And their conclusions were striking. The first conclusion is that the result of the achievement gap ed in education in this country has amounted to an economic recession, a permanent economic recession, larger than the recession we're currently experiencing. They also said that the international impact has made us non-competitive from an economic point of view. So I commit you to look at the McKinsey and Company report because it's the first time that non-educators actually try to qualify and quantify the impact of us not educating our children. Not only that, I was talking to the table with, with uh, my folks there about the outputs and the educational outputs and, and um, you know, Dr. Martin said she heard that DC's making gains and we are making gains. But see, I don't really believe in, 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 in I don't celebrate marginal increases in educational outputs for children, or marginal increases in test scores. You know, they're, 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 we have schools now and school districts that operate at 20% proficiency. That means that 80% of the kids are failing. And then the superintendent du jour, or, or the school reform plan du jour, which y'all know well in this area, I think. Y'all have had a fair number of superintendents. But, but, but they, 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 and I'm not criticizing them. This is what they have to do, and this is frankly what they're used to doing. They come up with a reform plan that says, give us three to five years and we're gonna fix it. And you know, that 20% in three to five years could be 30%. So that means you should celebrate the fact that we've gone from 20% of the kids passing to 30% of the kids passing. There's this whole dumbing down that has taken place where because things are so bad in terms of our outputs, because we're failing to take care of our kids, we celebrate mediocrity even at our kids' expense. And it wasn't supposed to be like this. You talk about the precepts of freedom. You talk about what was expected with the founding of this country. You know, Thomas Jefferson believed that what we should have had have happened is that we need to have an educated population in order to have a participatory democracy work. And this idea that each and every citizen should be responsible to make sure that his or her child is educated so that they can understand the responsibilities associated with democracy. They can understand the responsibilities and obligations associated with freedom. And they can be educated in all of the relevant areas so that they can participate the way it was envisioned in our Constitution. And what has happened over time is, as government got more and more involved in the delivery of these educational services to children, starting with Horace Mann 
in the 1830s in Boston with the compulsory attendance law, where it was understood that, you know, we do need to make sure there are some standards in place. We do need to make sure there's some uniformity in how we deliver these services, but it morphed into something that did not serve our children. This one-size-fits-all approach to education service delivery has failed our nation. And yes, I was on um, President Obama's Education Policy Committee, and as you might imagine, I didn't think I would survive the campaign. Um, I thought they'd kick me off after one of those uh, conference calls we had. But I survived. Um, and, <laughs> And, and largely, I was the one, and, and there were several others, but I was probably the more strident because I said, look, why in the heck, after all we've gone through in this country, why, why should we, when it is clear that what we have been doing is not working, why should we continue to celebrate mediocrity, and why should we promote the status quo over everyone else? I didn't sign on to this campaign, you know, to say I'm for change and to act like I'm not. And this idea of what we need to do to change education for our kids, I think, should be radical and complete. See, I don't believe in, in, in fraying around the edges. I don't believe in an in investment of millions and millions of dollars every year so that we go from 20% proficiency to 30% or 40%. See, if you're not over 90% proficiency, then you, aren't, you shouldn't be in the business. That should be the goal. This dumbing down is permeating our society. So much so that what we have done, we have compensated for the lack of, of uh, effort and positive results that we have had in educating our children by making everyone work around the ignorance that is among us. McDonald's started it. Kids can't count, put pictures on the cash register. Curriculum designers, I hope, I don't know if any of y'all in the room, but I hope, I don't mean to just call you out, but it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, textbook manufacturers, curriculum designers say, you know, War and Peace is a thousand pages. That's too much for these kids. So you can get an abridged, dumbed down version for like 700 pages. Everything we do now is designed to compensate for what we're not doing for our children, mainly what we're doing to our children. So it is my view that in terms of how we move forward and the policies we support, that parental choice is a big part of that. You know, another thing that, that Friedman said, and, and then I, I want to bring in a discussion about DC, he said, he said, he and his wife Rose wrote in, in, in a letter, we have concluded with the achievement of effective parental choice it requires an ongoing effort to inform the public about the issues and possible solutions. An effort that is not episodic, limited to particular legislation or ballot initiatives, but that is educational and ongoing. The reason why I point that out is because it is so frustrating for those of us who toil every day and labor to try to turn the light on this issue. It gets very frustrating and it's easy for some to want to give up. But that is the last thing we should do. Like George Washington and Abe Lincoln and all these people we hold in high esteem in this country who continue to fight for freedom, we should not stop this fight and nor should we let our weary eyes hold us from what we should be doing. Because Dr. Friedman was smart when he said this has to be ongoing. And where I live, D.C. is a great example. You know, in, in, in some, the, the D.C. education reform story is, is, is something that speaks to a consistent, you know, non-compromising, dedicated battle for change, and I believe we're on the verge of great things in D.C. for that reason. When I took over the chairmanship of the Education Committee back in 1997, we had just passed the charter school law, and it was very interesting. You know, I didn't know much about education, but it struck me that anything that, that all the negative social indices in society was directly traceable to the lack of a quality education. You know, where the people were educated, you had less homelessness, joblessness, crime, drug abuse, criminal behavior, 
I realize our pop prison population, just similar to prison populations all over the country, over 85% of these people incarcerated don't have a high school degree.